you concerning the church, but I would like to talk to you about the church as we study the Bible. Before the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, as Luke records in Acts chapter 2. And I would like to zero in on the purpose of the church. As you know, most people do not think of the church save in terms of denominationalism. We have long begged people to return to the Bible and the Bible only, for it will make Christians only and the only Christians. It's the only true infallible source book for Christianity that exists. And we need to understand what it has to say on whatever it has to say because it's addressed to you and to me and to all men regarding man's salvation needs. First of all, let's recognize that the church was in the purpose of God. Here's the way we approach this. At least as early as the birth of Saul of Tarsus, who would be chosen later, become the great apostle Paul to the Gentiles. Now listen to what we have from Paul's own writing in Galatians chapter 1, verse 15 through the first part of verse 16. But when it was the good pleasure of God, who separated me, Paul writes, even from my mother's womb, and called me through His grace to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach among the Gentiles, straightway I conferred not with flesh and blood. Now, what is it we can learn from this scripture, seeing it's written to us and God expects us to learn something from it? Well, from it we learn that God separated Paul from the time of his birth to preach the gospel among the Gentiles. Now, remember, it is the gospel that is God's power to save us, Romans 1.16. And that's the reason that Jesus commissioned the church to preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16, 15. Now certainly God knew that the preaching of the gospel of His Son Christ would result in the establishment of the church in communities wherever Paul preached the seed of the kingdom, which is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. Now to say that God purposed that Paul should preach the gospel but did not know that such preaching would result in the forming of churches of Christ, as that term is used by Paul in Romans 16, 16, is simply unthinkable. The Word of God is, as I said earlier, the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. Preaching the Word of God is doing nothing less or more than sowing the seed of the kingdom, Matthew chapter 13 verses 19 and 23. Now when the seed of the kingdom is sown in the minds or the hearts of people who are good and honest, Luke 8, 15, that is, it's allowed to have its way with them, then children of the kingdom will be the result, according to Matthew 13 and verse 38. And when you have a group of children of the kingdom in any community, you'll see that that constitutes the kingdom in that given geographic location. And since the kingdom is the church, according to Jesus himself in Matthew 16, 18, and 19, it follows then that this group of children of the kingdom produced by the preaching of the gospel is the church in that given community. Now, if you don't get the church in a community in that way, I'd like to know how you get it there. If there's no Christians there, how are you going to get Christians there without the preaching of the word, the seed of the kingdom? It was in the purpose of God that Paul should preach Christ among the Gentiles. And since this preaching results in the establishment of churches of Christ, I say again as that term is defined and used in the sacred writings, it follows that the purpose of God included churches of Christ. How? Through the preaching of the gospel of Christ. Churches of Christ can't exist without the preaching of the gospel and people believing the gospel and obeying the gospel. Since Paul was separated in the mind of God Almighty 
for his work as an apostle of Christ from the time of his birth, which we've noticed he declares in Galatians 1, 15 and 16, we know, at least at this point in our study, we know that the church was in the purpose of God as far back as the apostle Paul, that is the birth of the apostle. The next point I want to make is that the church was in the purpose of God back in the time of Moses. I read in Acts 26, 22, and 23, Paul writing, or Luke recording what Paul said, I stand this day testifying both the small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses did say should come. Let that sink in. How that the Christ must suffer, and how that he first, by the resurrection of the dead, should proclaim light both to the people and to the Gentiles. Now what do we learn from this? We learn that the prophets, <coughs> including Moses, foretold the suffering of Christ on the cross of Calvary. And the inspired apostle Paul tells us that Christ purchased the church with his own blood that he shed on that cross, Acts 20 and verse 28. I might emphasize that that church that Jesus built, Matthew 16, 18, Acts 2, was worth the purchase price. To belittle the church Jesus built is to belittle the price paid for it. Thus, by implication, to belittle the church Jesus built, you belittle the blood of Christ. Is it possible that God knew that his son would suffer on Calvary, but he did not know that he would purchase the church with the blood that he shed in that suffering on the cross? John saw the four living creatures and four and twenty elders fall down before Christ, the Lamb, and sing His praises. And when they did so, they said, For thou wast slain and did purchase unto God with thy blood men of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and madest them to be unto our God a kingdom and priests, and they reigned upon the earth. Revelation 5, 9 and 10. Now the people who purchased, who were purchased with the blood of Christ, the blood of the Lamb who was slain, are made to be a kingdom. You see, that's all in harmony with what we've noticed from the rightly divided word we've said thus far on this very purpose or on this subject. Now, a question. Did God know in the time of Moses that Christ would suffer? But he did not know that through his suffering, men would be purchased and those so purchased would constitute the kingdom that is the church. Now, such a conclusion is really unthinkable in the light of the rightly divided word, 2 Timothy 2.15. God knew and purposed in the time of Moses that the church should be purchased through the suffering of Jesus Christ that would be some 1,500 years after the giving of the law. The next point I want to make, the church was in the purpose of God in the time of Abraham back there in patriarchy. Paul tells us that there was revealed to him a mystery. Now that word mystery you'll remember means simply that which is unrevealed. So Paul uses the word mystery in saying it's now been revealed. And he says uh, in revealing to him this mystery, he says it was not so clearly known in generations preceding him. And then he said, quote, to wit, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, Ephesians 3 and verse 6. Now watch. The promise here mentioned is the promise made to Abraham 
that all nations were to be blessed in his seed, singular, Genesis 12, 3 and 22, 18. It's the fulfillment of this promise that we have all blessings of the gospel. Acts 3, we don't have time to go all through these, but Acts 3, 25 and 26, you'll read of that in the second recorded sermon that Peter preached. You'll also see Paul's argument on the same by using Galatians or by reading Galatians 3, 7 through 9. Now, when God told Abraham that all nations were to be blessed in his seed, singular, that is the Christ, according to Paul in Galatians 3, verse 16, what did he mean? Well, he meant that the Gentiles were to be fellow heirs with the Jews. They were to be fellow members of the body, which is, according to inspired writings, the church, Ephesians 1, 22, and Colossians 1, verse 18. It says so explicitly in those passages. And they were to be fellow partakers with the Jews of all that is included in the promise that God made to Abraham. And all these blessings were to come to the Gentiles through the gospel of Jesus Christ, of which Paul was made a minister and a preacher. Now, God could not plan for the Gentiles to be fellow members of the body, which is the church, without planning, without planning the existence of of the church. It is no afterthought. It is no accident. It is no matter to be treated lightly. It was in the mind of God, that is, the church. So we conclude that the church was included in the purpose of God when he made that promise of the long ago to faithful Abraham. Now the next point. The church was in the purpose of God you notice how we keep going back. The church was in the purpose of God before the foundation of the world. The expression, foundation of the world, has been interpreted by some to mean the beginning of the Christian dispensation. But I don't believe that. If you look at Paul's use of it in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, you'll see what I think is a parallel with the expression eternal purpose in Ephesians 3.11. Peter speaks of Christ being foreknown before the foundation of the world. But watch it. But manifested or revealed, manifested at the end of the times, and it's for our sake, 1 Peter 1.20. Now, the manifestation of Christ refers to the coming in the flesh, which was the period just preceding the Christian dispensation. When you begin the letter to the Hebrews, it begins this way. God, who at sundry times and divers manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophet, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Well, what were those last days? The last days of the Jewish dispensation. That's when Christ came. That's when Christ did his work. You remember it was John, the baptizer, the forerunner of the Christ, who plainly declared to the Jews to repent of your sins under the law and believe the message that the kingdom is at hand and pointed out Jesus to the Jews as the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. That was done in the last days of the Jewish dispensation. And so it is mentioned here. Now, Peter speaks of the foundation of the world as a time prior to the end of the times. That is, there was a time back before there was time. <laughs> now, why do I say it that way? Because I don't know how all the time to express eternity to finite minds as we live in time and space. Jesus said the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world would be required of his generation. And then he added this, that this includes all the prophets from Abel down to Zechariah. Now that's found in Luke 11, verses 50 and 51. 
From his use of the expression, we learn that the foundation of the world. Now listen. His use of the expression, we learn something. That the foundation of the world must extend back as far as Abel. So it must refer to the creation of the world. Now for the proof that the church has been in the mind of God since before the creation of the world. We would say in eternity, before God created, before he made material things, time and space. Paul says that it is God's eternal purpose that the wisdom of God is to be made known to the principalities and the powers and the heavenly places through one institution, the church. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 11. So what I learned, well, I learned at least one thing, thing, the church is included in the eternal purpose of God. It's not some sort of light matter. It was back there in the mind of God before time was. Paul teaches us that God chose in Christ before the foundation of the world that we, the members of the church, Christians, should be holy and without blemish before him in love. Ephesians 1 and verse 4. But now that's Ephesians 1. If you go to the end of the book, in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, we learn that it is the church for which Jesus gave himself that is to be holy and without blemish. Ephesians 5, 27. Yet such was planned for Christians before the foundation of the world. But it's the church that's holy without blemish. Now the obvious conclusion is the church, Christians, was in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. So the chosen of Ephesians 1 verse 4 is the Lord's church, Ephesians 5 verse 27. It doesn't surprise me that those who reject the truth of the Bible on the church would come up with the idea that it's a light matter. Jesus purchased the church with his blood. That, if nothing else, should say it's very important. But another thing tells us that when those were saved on the day the church began in Acts 2, the Lord himself adds those baptized for the remission of sins to his church. Why would he do that? Well, that's where the blood covers the sins of people. They were baptized, contacting the blood in the Death of Christ, that is, when we were buried with him in baptism, baptized into his death, Romans 6, 3 and 4, Colossians 2, 12. So the church was in the purpose of God before the foundation of the world. Paul spake of this same purpose as including the called, 2 Thessalonians 2, 14, and the justified, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, and those who were going to be glorified, Romans 8, 28 through 30. And they're all the same people. Peter says we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Then he goes ahead to say, Who was foreknown indeed before the foundation of the world? 1 Peter 1 and verse 20. Who was known indeed from the foundation of the world? Those purchased the blood of Christ. But Christ purchased the church with his blood. So all of this was in the mind of God before the foundation of the world is the way he would save man from sin. So from this context we learn that he was foreknown as a lamb through whose blood we would be redeemed. No wonder John said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Is it possible that God could have foreknown that Jesus would suffer as a lamb in sacrifice for the transgression of our sins, to redeem us, to buy us back with his blood from sin, and yet did not know that the redeemed would constitute the church which he purchased with that blood, Acts 20 and 28. I think logically, to use terms that fit it perfectly in logic, that's an absurd conclusion, and it's a wrong conclusion. So from this we learn that before the creation 
God knew man would sin, that he would give his son to suffer for man's sins, and those redeemed by the blood of Christ would be in the kingdom, the church, Revelation 5, 9, and 10. So the church was included in the purpose of God from the foundation, creation of the world. The church is not an afterthought with God. If these scriptures also teach anything, it shows you in the purpose of God, the church is so very, very important. It's not something hurriedly arranged to meet some kind of emergency because God didn't accomplish what he thought he could accomplish. What kind of a God is that? The church, next to heaven itself, is the very climax of all God's gracious purposes to show the exceeding riches of His kindness toward us who are Christians in Christ Jesus. Now, does that help us better understand why He begins? That is, Paul does the book of Ephesians by saying in verse 3 of chapter 1 that all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ Jesus. Thus, back to the Galatians, reminding them of what they did in becoming Christians. He declares that they were baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27, upon their faith in Christ, which faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10 and verse 17. Thus Christ had said in his great commission, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. No one's saved by hearing the gospel only or by the Bible only or by believing only or by repentance only or by confession only or by baptism only. No only saves anybody. It's all in its rightful place as we take the journey of learning and understanding and seeing the evidence that Christ is the Son of God and believing in Him that tells us to then repent of our sins, Acts 17, 30, confess our faith in Christ, Romans 10, 10. Now we're qualified by God to be baptized for the remission of our sins. And the Lord adds us to this church that before time existed was in the mind of God as to the place that he shows his glory and honor. The church is like a trophy to God. God could remain perfectly just and yet save sinful men. When perfect justice says sinful men ought to die, and they ought to die eternally. But Christ came and did for us as a man, just like you and me, what we could not do. And thus, as a man, he resisted all temptation, being tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. So he could offer his body on the cross of Calvary in our stead. He could shed his blood from a body that knew no sin and purchase the church of Jesus Christ, of which you read in your own New Testaments, and to which he adds all those who are obedient to the gospel, the power of God to save us from sin to that blood-bought institution, the church, which is also called the Bride of Christ. A host of folks make light of the church, don't understand it, and say, well, Jesus, yes, the church, no, or they corrupt the church. But I suggest to you that the purchase price tells us the worth of the church and the fact that inspiration calls the church the Bride of Christ. Ultimately, some of us men at least sit up and take notice as well as the women because the way people treat the church in general who claim to be its friends through ignorance or whatever in the Bible teaching about the same I wouldn't want to say about my bride and I don't think any decent bride would want that said about them yet people do so all day long claiming to be friends of God about the bride of Christ that was known in the mind of God before the world was, and to which every soul that will go to heaven is a part of, because in obedience to the gospel, the Lord adds them to it. And they're there to remain faithful till the Lord calls you home. What's happened to us in these days, even in the Lord's church, we don't study the New Testament. We talk a lot about it. Just think of how much we talk about the importance of Bible study. 
How many of us really get down there and read it every day, meditate on it day and night? And specifically, how many of us ever really look at what it says about salvation and the relationship of the church to the forgiveness of our sins and for those who are obedient to the gospel, who they are baptized into and to whom they are added? Think about these things. For someday there shall be a day of judgment in which all men shall give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. Friends, I tell you, if your mind's about you and you're thinking it all clear when you die, I've said it countless times and I'll continue to say it. You won't be concerned about your doctor's appointment the next day. You won't be concerned about the bills having to be paid. You won't be concerned about the, what the neighbor next door thinks about your cat. You won't be concerned about anything of the affairs of this present world. But I tell you in all boldness, there shall loom before us a vast eternity where we shall go to abide forevermore. And how we live here will determine where we reside there. And we shall either be in glory beyond the mortal mind to grasp, or we will be in abject poverty, pain, and anguish that no man can grasp. All dependent upon our decisions here. Is it any wonder then that Joshua said, Choose you this day, whom ye will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Abraham looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. My dearly beloved, that city is being formed on this earth by all those who humbly believe and obey the gospel and who live righteous lives in the church that was in the mind of God before the world was. The bride of Christ, the institution purchased by his precious blood to which he adds all the saved. That church, I tell you, is very important. And if we don't understand it, we better get to the Bible and understand it. If you're not a child of God today, we beg of you by the mercies of Christ to obey the gospel and become one. Lay aside your pride or whatever it is that's holding you back from doing what you know the Bible says. Do it honestly, and you'll be a Christian when you leave this place. If you're a child of God and you've let your work in the church slip, look what you've done. What have you put before the working of the church? All these things we do in this life, they're all going to pale into insignificance and burn up someday. Why will we give our time to that? When the things done as Christians in the church for the cause of Christ, our treasures sit on ahead where moth and rust and corruption and thieves cannot break through and steal nor cause to be lost. It's secure, waiting on us. When our Lord says, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. If you're subject to the blessed invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.